most of us just run from this conversation because it just is a difficult one. And here's the hard part is that it also can set you up for massive failure because of just how the brain works. If your job has any negative association in any way, shape, or form, it's going to trigger a negative frame. If you've been through this course, you understand the concept of framing. Framing is a construct of reality. Frames are triggered by all sorts of things, like if I say used car salesman, you're going to immediately probably, if I had to say that to you right now, you'd probably have a list of negative words, sleazy, slimy, dishonest. So if you're in a negative or untrusted job or profession, and you start with that, you're immediately triggering those frames, and those frames become filters by which people hear everything you say afterwards. The simple example is, don't worry, I'm a used car salesman. You can trust me. It's time to get inside your own head. Begin with the psychology behind your behaviors and fuse it with an acute understanding of self-awareness, emotion, storytelling, body language, and more. Then look at it all through the lens of the latest neuroscience research, broken down to its most digestible form. And you've arrived. Enhanced messaging, deeper connection, heightened influence, and a greater impact on the world. Welcome to the NeuroSide of Influence and Leadership with Renee Rodriguez. All right, welcome to another episode of the Amplify Podcast where we go deep into a lot of the ideas surrounding the concept and the class, the training, the boot camp, whatever you want to call it, the methodology of Amplify. The goal here is obviously to amplify your influence. And so today I want to, I want to get into three questions and maybe I'll sneak a fourth one in there. And these four questions, these three questions actually are ones that I think we all wrestle with. These questions are ones that we are dealing with and we're asked all the time in networking events. We're asked at family gatherings. Some of us hate it. I personally hate these questions. I torture my clients with these questions and, and they're actually quite simple, but yet we struggle in answering them. And the first one question is, who are you? So, let's, I mean, let's go through it. Like, who are you? Let's, I mean, actually, I'll, let's go through all three of them. Who are you? What do you do? And what makes you unique? Seem like three simple questions. Who are you? What do you do? What makes you unique? And questions that we get at parties, we get them in, uh, in one way, shape, or another at a family gathering. So, what are you doing? How are you? What are you doing these days? And there's this inherent question of really – at least we want to make sure we answer. We want to be unique. There's, there's a whole, there's, there's two sides to that because people buying from us, they want to know what makes us unique because otherwise if we don't talk about what makes us unique, remember our value pop proposition, if we don't have one, our client is going to create one for us and they're going to create it based on the only thing they know how to measure, which is price. Those are kind of recurring themes that you're going to hear from me. But this whole thing of who are you, what do you do? But we also want to be unique in this world. There's something... I think really there's a draw to that. There's something that we want to stand out, make our mark, right? So let's dive into that. So who are who are you? What do you do? What makes you unique? So who am I? So most of us answer that question in some sort of bulleted list of what we do. We go through, you know, whether we're a parent, we go through our job title. You know, I'm a doctor. I'm a teacher. Uh, I'm a loan officer. I'm a real estate agent. I'm an insurance agent. I, I, I'm a policeman. You know, there's there's this sort of resume that begins to unfold. And sometimes we'll add, you know, if we get creative, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a seeker of truth, and you'll hear those kind of things. And some people will say, well, I, you know, I'm, I heard one person say, I make the impossible possible and the simple sublime. And I looked at him and I smiled, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Still don't know what the hell you do, but that was pretty cool. And so there's a lot of attempts to be creative, and this is sort of the beginnings of that conversation of the elevator pitch, which we can kind of get into. But the, the, the question of who are you is not easy. And, I mean, now we can get into philosophy. Like, who are you? Why do you exist? Like, what's the, what's the who's behind all of this? And so then, all right, so what do you do? And then we get into the, again, resume further, but more detail. Because the who are you is like our name, right? And then details, the job titles and descriptions and most of us just run from this conversation because it just is a difficult one. 
And here's the hard part is that it also can set you up for massive failure because of just how the brain works. If your, if your, if your job has any negative association in any way, shape, or form, it's going to trigger a negative frame. And so if you've been through this course, you understand the concept of framing. Framing is a construct of reality. Frames are triggered by all sorts of things, like if I say used car salesman, you're going to immediately probably, if I just say that to you right now, you'd probably have a list of negative words, sleazy, slimy, dishonest. Uh, and, and so if you're in a negative or untrusted job or profession, <clears throat> and you start with that, you're immediately triggering those frames, and those frames become filters by which people hear everything you say afterwards. The simple example is, don't worry, I'm a used car salesman. You can trust me. And we might giggle at the thought of that. So <clears throat> the concept or be idea behind who are you, what do you do, again, we're getting into the what. What is it that we do? And none of this feels inspiring. None of it feels exciting. And then we try to go back into what makes us unique. And so now, this is where most people freeze. And they get that deer in the headlights look, looking at me, especially when I've asked it, and they kind of stare at me. And even these are highly successful people, six, seven digit earners, looking at me like, I don't know what makes me unique. I have some people come up with phrases. We had one person, <coughs> excuse me, come up on stage and they say, I'm a mortgage ninja. One person said they're a mortgage doctor. Some people said, uh, simple, uh, make the impossible possible, simple, sublime, like I said before. But is that really what makes us unique? You know, there's, it's, they're really in most industries, there are very few patent monopolies out there. And the, the, the advantages are few and far between in those types of industries. If you talk about a teacher, what makes a teacher unique? Well, we use a certain kind of learning. Okay, well, there are very, very few and unique or very few differentiated techniques for learning. But we're looking for something that truly is unique. And we're going to kind of dive into that. And then the last question, the fourth question is, who cares? Like, honestly, like, who cares? And I don't mean that in an offensive way. I don't mean that in sort of a judgmental way. It's just, but like, honestly, who does, who cares? Like, who are you? What do you do? What makes you unique? And then who really cares? So we have to be able to address these questions in a way that really taps into the essence of what you're trying to communicate. And so we have to rethink all of this. We have to throw out everything and how we're used to answering it. And the first part is we have to get used to a couple of different things and we have to unlearn some stuff. And the first one is, is that most people don't put much thought into the questions that they ask us. And so <clears throat> the thinking behind this, you've been, I'm sure you've been this or somebody's asked you a question or you asked a question like, hey, how are you? And the person asked and you're thinking to yourself, why did I even ask? Because one, I didn't have the time and I really wasn't interested. And they pull out their photo books and their photo albums or something that you're just like, oh my goodness, I don't know why I ask because I'm not interested. And, and it was sort of this rote routine, automatic response of just saying, hey, how's it going? And you really weren't interested. And so that's a whole other issue. But <clears throat> most people don't put much thought into that. You know, what do you do? What's your price? You know, we just don't put much thought because we're trying to figure out what's the value. At the end of the day, what's the value? And so if, if most people don't put much thought into the questions that they ask us, then there's another component we have to think about. We also feel this overwhelming, overwhelming sense to answer any question that is asked of us. And it's, it's this crazy response. Somebody asks a question we feel like we have to answer, and if we don't, we feel like we're lying. And I'll share a short story about that. I was working with a chief operating officer of a company and they were going through a major transition and she was thinking about possibly wasn't sure it was a remote idea of leaving there were rumors going around <clears throat> and the questions were going I mean the company was just in, in turmoil a very successful company but you know anytime there's change and transition and, and the CEO is leaving and, and there's just change it's just how it is right good companies and get used to that by the way Good companies go through change. High-performing organizations have struggle. 
So do low performing ones. Great families have conflict. It's just what it is. And so they're going through this and I get a phone call and she's like, I need help figuring out how to answer this. I don't know what to do. People keep answer, asking me if I'm leaving and I just feel like I'm lying to them and I don't know what to do. And she goes on and on and on. And I said, let me ask you a question. Do you feel that just because someone asks you a question that they're entitled to an answer? And she said, well, yeah, I, I do. And I said, great. When was the last time you had sex? And she sits there and I said, don't answer that question. I said, kind of inappropriate, isn't it? And she's like, yeah. I said, that's my point. Is that Now, that <clears throat> question isn't about you or to help you. That would be to serve some sort of curiosity that somebody would have. And so the questions that people are asking if they're leaving, is it really about your well-being? Or is it to serve some sort of need that they have? What's the great book out there, by the way, Question Behind the Question, the QBQ? Look it up. And <clears throat> so this concept of what, what she's asking or this person that's being asked isn't really about serving them. It's serving something else. And so we have to be able to look as leaders, what are they really asking? And they make, because the, if the person really cared, they'd be like, hey, I know you're going through a lot. Is there anything that I need to know that might affect my ability to do my job here? That might be a question. Is there anything you need from me to help you? But no, hey, are you leaving? Because I want to know. Maybe it's sometimes even just gossip. And I, so I said, and she started laughing, and I said, so here's the thing. They're not entitled to an answer. I said, but they do, you are their leader, so they need leadership from you. So what does leadership mean in this moment? And I said, let me ask you a question. Do you know if you're leaving? She said, no. I said, well, there's your most honest answer. What do you know for sure? And she sat there and I said, I'm assuming that people have to get focused on the, she was, yes, they have to get focused on the business. We need is now more than ever. She got really super clear. And I said, so your answer then is, somebody says, are you leaving? You say, look, there's a lot of change going on right now. Currently, I have no plans of going anywhere. I don't know what the future holds for anyone for me, for you, but right now what I do know is that this organization needs us to focus. I need you to focus on what we have in front of you. Is there anything that I can do to help you get focused and making sure that we execute on the strategy that lays out in front of us? Now, all of those things, now even, in, even as I said that out loud, I love analyzing even stuff that I say because it's the process of analyzing the words that come out of our mouth is I think one of the biggest learnings. So I said, I don't know what holds true for me or for you in the future. That creates uncertainty, right? So even as I said that as an example, probably not what you wanna say because uncertainty creates fear, triggers that system one response and can create the fight, flight, freeze response. So right now, I'm not planning on going anywhere would be her honest response. And what I do know though, is that this organization and I need you to focus and I need to focus, this organization needs us to focus so that we can execute on that in front of us. Is there anything that I can do to help you with your job? And now she's turned it around and she's asking the questions and getting her focused again on what matters most. Now, I'm not using this, and this is the, the hard part about stuff like this, is that you can use this to um, roll around questions and dodge questions. That's not what this is about. This is where the ethical conversation comes in play and needs to happen. This is truly about, in this sense, a sense of privacy. Some people have that sense of, or not sense of, they have the right to say, I need to think about what's going on. And leaders are going through questions and dilemmas and rumors that are going on. And she quite honestly didn't know what her plan was. And so because she was faced with that, she was faced with something to give a, an answer that would have just caused more stress and pain. <clears throat> but leadership is about creating clarity and direction and influencing that behavior to focus on what needs to happen next. And so that her ability to answer that question is what created the influence. And so this piece, so one, people don't put much thought into the questions that they ask. And two, we feel this overwhelming compulsion to answer any question asked of us. We have to get rid of those two pieces. We have to just get rid of that. We have to stop and unlearn that old habit. And then the third piece, which is the scariest part, is the person asking the question is leading, is leading. So if you put all three of those together, I'm allowing someone to lead me who didn't put much thought into the direction that they're leading. 
and I'm feeling compelled to answer and follow. That's not a great formula. <laughs> I'd rather follow somebody that put a lot of thought into where they're going. And so we need to be able to question the question. We need to be able to sit back and say, okay, is this really what's going on? And so if somebody says, who are you, what do you do, what makes you unique? You need to fight the urge to answer that in that sequence. And so that's where we get into this concept of sequencing too, right? There, there, that might not be the right sequence to start with. Who are you, what do you do, what makes you unique? And so the, the process is we all have to, though, be able to answer this question, these questions in a way that does capture attention and that drives action, right? Because we want to be able to capture attention. But who am I? Hi, I'm Rene Rodriguez, and I'm a keynote speaker. Doesn't capture attention. Now, if you're super into keynote speakers, that might be cool. Oh, cool. Have I seen any of your work? Odds are probably not. Unless you're in a certain industry, you, you probably haven't. Maybe, you know, there's certain industries maybe you have. If I'm lucky, you maybe caught something, or maybe, you know, I get the, the courteous. I'm like, you know, I thought you sounded familiar, which, you know, probably isn't the case. Uh, maybe someday. Pass this along and share this podcast, and, and maybe we'll get there. But, you know, we all want to capture attention. But starting that way isn't going to do it. It's just not how our brain is wired. And so the next piece, we, we all have to figure out how we're going to do it. And, and the way that we do that is going to be a little different than what you think. And, but the way that we do that is usually going back to something as simple as how we got started. Because we all have ideas that we need to share. We all have ideas that we want to share into this world. We, we have, whether it's, you know, where we want to eat uh, at a restaurant with our family, can we persuade them to do that? Maybe we want pizza that night. And as a kid, you always wanted pizza, but for some reason, uh, you couldn't persuade it. And maybe it's what movie you wanted to watch. Maybe it's the direction that you want to take a project. Maybe it's a customer to buy something from you. Maybe it's a date that you want to go on. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's a, a, a investment that you want someone to make in your business. Those are all ideas. And to me, an idea is something that needs energy and attention to come to life and sometimes money to come to life. And so attention is another, or money is another form of attention. I'm taking this energy, this, I, put my, I put my time and effort and knowledge into something and my reward was this, these dollars. And I'm going to take this energy and attention and effort and I'm going to invest it in you. So those are ways of looking at investment. But that's the, the, the redirection of all that is what influence is about. It's kind of a big ask. So there's got to be a big reward. There's got to be a big promise. And there's got to be trust. There's got to be all those things involved. And when you get into really understanding that, then you start getting into all the things that get in the way of it, which is really what I want you to think about. Because two humans, if we didn't have the things that got in the way of trust, like there's certain parts of the brain that are designed to protect us, certain parts of us that are designed to keep us alive, and they're not always rational, and they respond to stress, they respond to, respond to fear, and they respond to the unknown. Well, life is full of stress, unknown, and that's why we start that way. So understanding those different elements, we need to be able to structure a conversation and a response in a way that addresses that and creates that structure and that psychological safety so that we can move forward. So we all have these ideas. We need to communicate those. Now, our success, to me, I believe in anything, really depends on your ability to communicate an idea in a way that captures attention, but also drives action. I, there are a lot of ideas that capture attention, but people don't act upon. We call it entertainment. It's great. We need it. But the purpose of entertainment is the passing of time, the reduction of stress. That's not influence in business. Unless you paid to be in the door, and I paid for that, but most of us need to sell a product or a service. I need to drive something. And so all of the things that led to you purchasing the ticket were the influence to get you in the door. And so if you're listening to this or watching this video, you need to be able to influence that. And so all of that and the ability for you to be able to answer that is also part of the beginnings of understanding your ethos, your essence, which is at the core of your brand. A lot of times people make the mistake when it comes to, to working on brand and they start with design. Well, we're going to redo our brand, and so we hired a, a designer. I said, okay, well, people ask me all the time, what did we do to create our brand? And it wasn't starting with a designer. It was starting with a copywriter. And I called a friend of mine who is a ridiculously talent, Matt, uh, talented, Matt Walsh, uh, runs a company called The Greenstone, 
when most decorated, recognized uh, user experience design designers in the world and worked with some of the most iconic brands in the world. And I called him up and I said, I can't afford you, even though in the I can't even afford your friends and family discount. I said, but what do I do? It's a first step that we need to do here. And he said, you need to hire a copywriter. I said, what do you mean? A copywriter? I, I can write. I, don't worry, I got copywritten. He goes, you don't understand. You need to figure out what your ethos is. And I, I looked at him and I said, my ethos? I said, what do, you, what do you mean my ethos? I go, I use the word ethos all the time, but I think you're using it differently because ethos is your credibility and your character. And he said, your ethos is also the essence of who you are. And I sat there, I'm like, what the heck does that mean? The essence of who I am. And I, quite honestly, transparently, I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. But I trusted him. And I said, you want me to start with a copywriter before I start with brand? He said, yes. I said, he goes, then you take that copy and you give it to a designer. And now a designer knows how to, how to where to go with it. And I'm like, I don't, wait, hold on a second. That doesn't make any sense. Why would words do that? Anyways, I call this guy. I get on the phone with him. His name is Josh Blatterman. And if my person is, hey, man, what's up, bro? Immediately, he's got this sort of laid back, awesome vibe to him. And you can just tell that he's an artist. And I've got my recorder there. And I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm recording the conversation. I'm highly stressed out trying to figure out what this first step is. And he's like, well, just tell me about who you are. And I'm like, okay. Uh, I literally put my head down and talked for about an hour. I bring my head up, <coughs> tell them stories, and I just went anywhere. I'm like, are you capturing any of these notes? And he goes, don't worry about it, bro. I got this. Keep going. And I'm like, okay. So I kept talking, kept talking. We're almost three hours into this, and I'm wondering, is this guy going to say anything? Is he capturing any notes? And he maybe asked me a couple questions, and every, you know, he, would, he was really good at the, oh, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. You know, giving me sort of the validation points and a little bit of audit, auditory feedback to keep me, keep me moving along. And at the end, he goes, all right, man. He goes, this is good. I'm going to go paint something for a little bit and go see my, my son. And uh, give me a couple of days. I'll come back to you. I'm like, paint something? He goes, yeah, I like to paint and think. I'm like, all right. Yeah, I don't, I don't like to get in the way of an artist and what they do. So he comes back to me a few days later with a document with words like neuro-innovator, neuro-innovation, and phrases like Renee's impact doesn't leave the room when he does. And fluff is not enough. And Renee's su success metric isn't applause, it's results. And I was like, how did he capture in just one phrase some of the things that were my biggest struggles to communicate and that, that I'm trying to leave an impact that far exceeds the time of which we spend together? And he, he had these phrases and, and it started to make sense to me of what my ethos was. And it was five pages of this stuff. And we went back through about three, four iterations of this. And my friend Matt Walsh came back and he gave his iterations, which was genius. And then I hand, I go, what do we do with this document? Because I don't even know idea what we do. Then we gave that document over to a designer. My designer looked at this. He started salivating. George works for us full time. He's ridiculously talented. He said, thanks. Comes back to me three weeks later. This whole concept around this was neuroscience. That was because they asked me, what's the one word we want to learn, sort of own in the marketplace? And we kept going to neuro, neuro, neuro. And he looks at me, and they showed me our logo. If you haven't seen my logo, you see that if you look closely, you'll see that there's a ne use of a negative space that makes the word neuro. So here it was, 27 years of my life, devoted to understanding neuroscience. And it's in my name. The N and the E at the end of Renee. And then the space between Rodriguez and Renee, we turn into a, a, a U. And then the R and the O is the neuro. And we just look at my logo. MeetRenee.com, you'll see it there. And I was blown away. So this process of finding out who I was and the essence of who I was, of what I believed, and where I came from, and the stories of which it came from, and understanding let me see if I can pull this up here as I'm on here as well, because the understanding of where that came from started now lending itself to design and color palettes and structural pages and all the elements that really started to matter. And what was so fascinating to me was 
it started making me feel more confident. So when people asked me who I was, it was a much easier question to answer because I felt it internally. And so we had him write my bio and we looked at this. And I'll just read you the first part of it. And he's such a different kind of writer, but it's, it's, it's a piece. You get to the page and it says, his cli- no, no, this is, it's, it basically says, born amongst the palm trees and the percussion of Miami, Rene began splitting his time in frosty Minnesota as a teen. This continuum of climates and cultures introduced him to a breadth of, human, of the human condition at a young age. He then attended the University of St. Thomas, where he began to see the power of applying neuroscience to create personal and professional change. So the percussion of Miami, he knew that because he knew that I liked to play the drums in Miami, being Cuban, all these things that were, and I read that and I start getting happy. When your essence is tapped into the who you are, you start feeling it in a different way. You start feeling it. And so then now, we know this, and I'm going to talk to you salespeople and leaders. You know that people buy into things emotionally. We defend it logically. But yet, if we know that so well, why are all of our presentations so logically driven? The features and the benefits, and all, which is important, by the way. I'm not, I'm not downplaying it. It is critical. But we lost sight of the emotional side. But yet we want people to buy, and we say we talk about it. We can all finish. We people buy based on what emotions, but nobody has a presentation based on emotions. And we also know, sales one hundred and one, selling is a transference of feeling, which means what I am feeling, my client will feel. That is also true in the world of speaking and influence. And we tell people all the time: if you can't feel your story, neither can your audience. So, this is on the phone with. Um, with Bradley, and I don't know if you know Bradley, follow him, the real Bradley, and we had been talking about this, he's an amazing, amazing speaker, extremely successful businessman, businessman, and runs, uh, started a company 21 years ago, the first one to start virtual training, lightspeedvt.com, and he's use, using some of this, these principles, and he said, he was, he was, he was it got me emotional on stage, and he kind of started laughing, because he's <clears throat> sort of a man's man, and he's up there. I mean, he's just an incredible speaker. And he goes, but the audience started crying. And it's amazing when, as an influencer, and, and him, just an ounce of that pathos, the pathos of emotional appeal, an ounce of it sometimes is all that's needed to move an audience. But he's got to feel, and he felt that story, which means his audience felt the story. But when you're talking about this, and if, you, if you're not feeling who you are, you're not in touch with that, how's, how's your audience going to feel who you are? Sometimes it's like, who are you? Keynote speaker. Who are you? I'm a keynote speaker. And you say that with a smile and you have a look in your eye that all of a sudden, so really, what are you talking about? Leadership, influence, change. Even that's a boring answer, but if you say it with a smile, it's a little bit more to it. There's something else there. But, and it's in, this isn't even about how to sell it. This is about owning it. That who you are, the words we can figure out. We're going to talk a lot about it. Keep making sure you follow this because we're going to get into the details of all this stuff. But the essence of who you are is that ethos. All of those elements coming together, but we have to be able to feel it, feel it first. And so <clears throat> there's who are you, what do you do, what makes you unique, It's another hard one. I'll give you some hints on that one. The value propositions that you choose today, and this is, I never expected to discover this, but this is truly one of those discoveries after working with thousands of professionals and leaders and salespeople and people trying to learn how to tell their story. We found a consistency in one thing, that the, for some reason that the value proposition and the, 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 the people chose, the value proposition they chose came from somewhere it wasn't an accident. For some reason, they gravitated towards something, whether it was why, why I like to educate my clients. Well, why didn't you choose lowest cost provider? <clears throat> well, there's a story behind that. There's always a story behind it. And <clears throat> that story, what we've come to find out, is either to solve one of two things. It's either to heal our past or honor it. Meaning, if you like to educate your clients. Maybe your parents loved to educate you. Maybe they were teachers. Or maybe they loved to work with you and help and coach. Maybe they were coaches. 
Or maybe somebody took advantage of your parents financially and you vowed to never let that happen. And so you wanted to educate people on finance. And so that process, that would be the healing side, but the honoring would be if they were that way, you were that way. If you have a clean house and they had a clean house, you're honoring that. If they were slobs and you have a clean house, maybe you are, uh, maybe you are uh, healing that. So this, the value propositions and who we are, what we do, there, are, there is a breadcrumb. We call it breadcrumbing. You follow the breadcrumbs back. And it's not always easy to do on your own because we, especially if you have any level of success, you have a very positive trait, which is a short memory around negative experiences, around adversity. If you have a short memory around adversity, that means that you move forward quickly. You shifted gears. You have a lot of serotonin running through your system. When you have serotonin, that means you can shift from one gear to the next and you move on. You don't sit there and dwell. When serotonin is low, you have a hard time shifting out of the negative. Serotonin levels are high. You move forward. You keep going. You keep going. You keep going. Now, with that piece, this process asks you <clears throat> to explore some of those old stories. And by exploring some of those old stories, it's not always easy. But I'll tell you, it's enlightening because it helps you understand who you are and where you came from and why you do what you do and why you do what you do. And what's really cool is that when you can connect all of those dots, when you connect all of those dots, you start realizing and figuring out what your purpose is. That's the beginning of that conversation. And we've all felt and met somebody that's driven by purpose. We've met people that are driven by passion. Wow, passion, it's incredible. Like they're passionate, it feels good, and they're excited. But there's a difference between passion and purpose. We know that there's a difference. There's something just unique. Because when somebody plays with passion, we're like, wow, that's, that's really cool. We can admire that. But then when somebody plays with purpose, there's almost something of like, I want to learn how to do that. There's something that draws us in. And <clears throat> that self-discovery, that self-journey of knowing that and connecting those dots, I will tell you, creates for a much better quality of life. Because you wake up and you know why you're here. And do you have it all figured out right away? No. Do you need to have it all figured out? No. Is it a journey? And does the journey make you happy? Yes. Just begin the journey of discovery. Because the discovery itself is the reward. The journey itself is the reward. The questions are the answer. I know that sounds super philosophical, because it is. It's the examination of life. If you're out there leading and you haven't examined your own life, I think Einstein said the unexamined life isn't worth living. We got to examine our life. Why we do what we do. People that follow you want you to do that. And if you don't believe me, think about somebody that you love to follow, somebody that inspires you. Take a moment, put that person in your brain. How good does it feel when they inspire you? It feels awesome because you feel something like they, they, they plugged you in, right? Something inside of you lit up and you want to go. That feeling is exhilarating. And you want to follow them because you trust where they are taking you and you're excited where, they where they're taking you. What I find fascinating is that people that have the ability to take us somewhere, to lead us somewhere, forget that others need that feeling from them. They make us feel that way because they're, they're the humility of like, oh, why is anybody not there? Nobody's going to pay attention to me. I'm just me, and so I'm just going to do what I do. And sometimes people are called to lead. And when they're called to lead, they need to step up. Some of us don't have that luxury. Some of us of just sitting back. Some of us, leadership is thrust upon them because they have skill sets. They've been given something, or maybe they've just been chosen by the community. We believe in you. Whether you believe in yourself or not doesn't matter. We believe in you. And now the community has pushed you forward. So that might be you. If you're a parent, guess what? It is you. Your kids need you to lead. If you're a manager, it is you. And so these questions of who you are, what do you do, what makes you unique, are powerful. I do have a lot of 
examples of these, what we call these little transformational stories. If you go to amplifymylife.com and you scroll down, you'll see transformational stories. Sam Parker uh, is one of our one of our favorites where he gets in there and his is humorous and yet touching. Humorous in that he's he's a perpetual um 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 guy. What do you do? Hi, I'm Sam Parker. Uh, a husband to my wife Trish and father of three kids, kind of goes through the whole piece. And then by the end of the story, he's telling you a story about how he was in the wrestling mat and 17 years devoted to that and how that transitioned. It was, it's a powerful story. And you also have Tony Talman. And he, his story was fantastic, huge producer in his industry and came to us in a very robotic, but man, just very, great leader. But here's what I do. Here are my numbers. This is what we're looking for. That's all I got to say. And then by the end, he figured it out. You know, who are you? What do you do? His beginning was 33 years ago, I remember with my father going to work with him one day at this company called Ready Strip. And I remember him walking in and people looking around. And, and so he tells a story about what it felt like to have a great culture and the dream of having that and how he thought he found it. He went to work for this company and he was so disappointed. He fell on his face. And he found another one, he fell on his face again, and he made this decision to work for himself to create what he was missing. And it's this beautiful story, sort of this mini hero's journey, and created it for himself. And now at the end, he's, you know, you know, and he goes, if any of this is like, if you like any of this, you know, reach out and talk to me, let's talk. And it's a recruiting video, but it's not even a typical recruiting video where we're trying to find everybody. He just wants people, he wants to talk to people that believe what he believes. And that's the beauty of sharing who you are to the world because when you share who you are to the world, those that believe and buy into that, it becomes a honing signal, like the bat signal for those that want to, oh, there's, that's a belief system that I believe in. Let's go towards that light. But if you also think about it this way, there's this belief system I don't believe in. We don't need to go there. It also filters out the waste of time. And I don't see waste of time as a negative. It's if you don't believe it, you, you you guys don't believe the same thing, you probably shouldn't work together, and that's okay. So the honing signal is important because we have to be able to communicate that, communicate it loudly, and in a way that attracts the people that are on the same mission as we are. So Julie was another one that's on our website. She came to us. She was 25 years old, never given a talk before. CEO of Purus came to us. Who Purus was actually his name is Tyler uh, Florenzen. They were just named the number one most innovative food company in the world. We're so incredibly impressed and proud by what, what, the, what these folks are doing. And he said, Renee, they've got a, they gave us a TED talk. Can you help Julie? Uh, excuse me, Julia, get ready. And I was like, okay, she ever talked? She's never talked. We walked her through the process and oh my gosh, she was nervous. Smart, came up with 85 pages of research of nitrogen fixation and what happens with peas when you plant them and you know, uh, dead zones and what needs to and, and, and fertilization efforts and, oh my God, overwhelming. But with TED Talk, you only have a chance to give one idea. One idea, 13 to 17 minutes, and she had 85 pages of research and wanted to do it all. And the video is pretty fun because you get a chance to watch her go through the process and her nerves go through the roof. And, but holy wow, she is a student. She also played college basketball, so she took all that effort and all that discipline and pointed it right towards this process and you watch the end in her TED talk and she nailed it every bit of it and the funny part was she fought me and fought me for weeks on her opening story she wanted to talk about statistics and I wanted her to tell her basketball story of when she got in an accident and a traumatic brain injury <clears throat> and now funny part about that story is we fought and I finally said you know what go away for a couple of weeks tell both stories. You tell me which one people resonate with. She comes back and she looks at me and she's like, people hated my stats and they loved the, sto the, the story. And it was kind of funny, but it was a good eye opener. But when you watch the story, remember amplifymylife.com, scroll down and watch Julia. You'll see how impactful that story was because she could tie it down and make it relevant. So who are you? What do you do? What makes you unique? And who cares? We need to start getting on path to answer all those questions. Well, this is the end of this episode. I appreciate you listening in. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at Speak. Go to amplifymylife.com and take a look at our events that are coming up. And if you want to learn more about me, the team, 
amazing team behind us with Jenny and Maddie and George and some of the other people that are coming on board. Go to meetrene.com. You can learn about the team. And if you want us to speak at your event, please reach out to us and we'd love to work with you. Again, this is a, another episode of the Amplify podcast. We will see you and talk to you next time. Take care.